My name is uh, William Dickerson Wahid. I'm uh, currently living in Selma, Alabama. I have for the last decade been engaged in documenting mostly two of the formable events that happened in Alabama, the Montgomery bus boycott movement, and also the backstory of the Selma voters rights movement. I am originally from North Carolina, I spent most of my life in the deep South. During that time in Mississippi, I began to see, you know, some serious contradictions uh, in the civil rights movement in terms of what the public was being taught and what I learned directly from some of the participants, one in particular, Kwame Toure, who was still in Mississippi in the 70s. And then there were the local people like Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander, the the author of Jubilee, and how she was instrumental in 1968 in actually starting the Black Studies Movement at Jackson State University. And she got all kinds of resistance to be able to do that. And so from these, from those two people, I began to look at why it was important that we have teachers that were well-informed, and teachers that would teach, would be able to teach, not in an indoctrination, but in terms of thinking and doing. And so I was fortunate to have the opportunity to have been in Mississippi when they still had some freedom schools. So I worked with one of the freedom schools, the Black and Power School. Uh, Howard Spencer was the director. And it was just a holistic school where you were learning about governance, you were learning about how the responsibility that of citizenship, we've learned about how we had to force the doors open to be able to participate. But we were also learning about the importance of economic development and sustainability. And so the Freedom Schools was, to me, the beginning of understanding teaching relevant to the present situation, but also understanding it from a historical context. But you have to understand, I, I came out of North Carolina public schools, secondary schools. We never had one paragraph about the Wilmington riot. It wasn't even discussed. I didn't know anything about it. I mean, I was out of Mississippi when I found out about it. Uh, 30 minutes from my home was Princeville, North Carolina, the first incorporated city by former enslaved Africans. Never been there, never knew anything about it. And so it was this kind of miseducation but I don't blame the teachers. The teachers didn't know. They taught what they thought was important for us. Uh, I came out of a sharecropping family. The message was go to school, make good grades, get a job, move up, and then move out. So the migration, so when I graduated in 1966 with my diploma, uh, the very next week, there were a herd of us on buses and trains going to New York, going to DC, going to Baltimore, going to Philly, because our teachers taught us that to get a better way of life, you had to leave from where you were. But we never really learned about North Carolina history. In fact, I, we, they, they took us to Charles B. Acock's birth home is in my county. And we had to pass it every day on the school bus going to our school. We never knew that Charles B. Acock was the reason why 
black voters were stripped of the rights to vote in 1900. I didn't know my grandfather's farm that he was sharecropping on a farm by the Acock family. But I did know my social conscience was that I understood that sharecropping was a pariah. You know, it just robbed him of his life resources. So I understood the social dynamics of it, but we never knew that Charles B. Acock was a major player in that. We were taught that he was a hero. I became very conscious of the issue of teachers being able to teach freely and to be able to challenge students with critical thinking, with historical facts. Jim Lowe and, uh, wrote a book, uh, Lies My Teacher Told Me, uh, about some of the misrepresentations, especially in Mississippi and uh, throughout the country. And he had to wage a legal battle with the Mississippi Board of Education for the book to be allowed to be used by teachers in the classroom, even as a supplementary material, to even be able for teachers to be able to order it and put it in the library. So I became very conscious of it then. When I um, left Mississippi and came to Alabama, started working on a documentary film project to talk about the, the backstory of the Montgomery bus boycott to begin to share information about what really happened there. And I went there with basically what I think most people knew. Most people thought that Dr. King came to Montgomery to start the boycott. Most people thought that Mrs. Parks refused to give up her seat and they said that she was too tired and so she that's why she didn't stand up. So these are the things that most of us were taught and that the boycott started because of the community wanted to desegregate the bus. And these were the only things that were allowed to be taught in the classrooms, nothing else. So it's only when we have teachers that are able to teach to the conditions that exist in the community. But our teachers are so constrained. They're given things that they have to do. They don't have the opportunity to get the children in a laboratory real world so that the children are able to take what's happening in the community, study it in the classroom, and then learn things in the classroom to be, go, be able to go back and share and give back to the community. So that's the conjuring that we are in. So what has emerged, what has emerged now is that the education has become the new political battle. CRT, nobody was teaching CRT. I mean, Derek Bell talked about it 20, 25 years ago. Nobody even brought it up. But now it came up and it just became, it's used as a political tool. It has no other value than political tool. I don't know no time in my formal education have teachers ever taught about the relationship to race and economics. They didn't talk about slavery. They didn't talk about Wilmington, North Carolina. They didn't talk about any of those things. And so we know it's just a political ploy, it's just like the gun issue. These are just political ploys. So the, the constraint on teachers whether they are formal in the classroom or whether they're community educators, is to prevent them from getting their children, their students, the opportunity to do critical thinking, critical assessments, critical planning, to look beyond the present. Everybody's comfortable with celebrating the civil rights movement. 
it's become one of the biggest tourist industries that you can imagine because it's all about the past and people are very comfortable with that. It's, it's all about shared grievances as opposed to shared visions. And what teachers do is get students to start thinking about shared vision. And that's what the constraint is. And so I hope that this project that we are doing will contribute some on, on a small scale to begin that process of shared visions of, of being able to not just teach about the past, but talk about what is happening right now today in our communities and how and what we can do to make life better.